Hello everyone and welcome to our talk on waders of the Kaikoura coast. My name's Hazel and I'm here with Rick. Hello everybody. And we haven't really been living here in Kaikoura for very long, only since October last year. But we both have a big interest in birds and really the main reason for us coming to stay here was because it's the world's best place for seabirds. But another of our favourite groups of birds is the waders or shorebirds and we've both been involved in studying shorebirds for quite a long time both back in back home in the UK and also in Australia over the last few years so we were really pleased to be invited to um, do this talk on waders of the Kaikoura area as part of the summer speaker series organised by the Department of Conservation here in Kaikoura. Now waders are really interesting as a group, they're very diverse um, and they show a lot of variety in what we're going to call life strategy and this is what we're referring to in the subtitle of our talk. So some species stay in the same place pretty much all the time um, and that's what we're referring to as long-term locals. Other species are like us and they're seasonal residents only here for part of the year and then there are other species that um, are really just passing through. So they're, they're the short stay visitors. They're like all, a lot of the tourists that come here to visit Kaikoura. They just stay for a day or two. They might go whale watching or book on a dolphin swimming tour and then they'll move on elsewhere. And our talk today is going to be about the species that we see here in Kaikoura. But before we start talking about any of the particular species that we see around here, we do need to clear up what exactly we mean when we talk about waders or shorebirds. And they're two different terms for exactly the same group of birds. However, both of those terms are quite misleading. Uh, for instance, there are plenty of waders uh, that don't wade, plenty of shorebirds that don't occur on the shore, and on the other hand, there are plenty of birds that aren't shorebirds that, nevertheless, do occur on the shore and may even wade. So how exactly do we define a shorebird? Well, all of the world's bird species are divided into 28 major groupings called orders. And we're interested in one of those orders, and that's this one here, uh, called the Charadriforms and all of the world's waders, shorebirds, fall into this one order. Uh, it's quite a big, diverse order, uh, which is further subdivided into quite a number of different families, which are listed here. The number on the right indicates the number of species uh, found in each of the families. So we've got some very big families, such as the Scolopacidae at the top, which is the Sandpiper family, containing 95 species worldwide. And then there are a number of families which contain maybe just one or two uh, fairly obscure species um, that we don't need to worry too much about tonight. However, just to confuse matters, um, not all of the charadriforms are generally treated as shorebirds. For so some of the groups, the ones that we've greyed out here, are very different to the others different enough in terms of their appearance, their lifestyle, their diet, and that it makes little sense to treat them alongside the others. So we've got things like the gulls and the terns, puffins and other orcs and the button quails, uh, which, although related to the others, are so different in their habits and other ways that it doesn't make much sense to study them alongside the other shorebirds. So when an ornithologist talks about waders or shorebirds, they're generally discounting uh, these greyed out groups uh, and concentrating on the others which do share enough similarity uh, in terms of their lifestyle, their appearance, their habits uh, and the bit of relatedness for it to make much more sense to treat these as one complete group. But even though they are considered a group, there are lots of exceptions. Uh, for example, there are um, shorebirds that actually live in the desert, and there's a species that 
nests by digging a burrow rather than laying its eggs directly onto the ground like most other species do. Um, and so for this reason, that's why it makes more sense to define a shorebird by what it's not than rather um, what it actually is because there's no one thing that um, groups them all together that they all have in common. So let's now concentrate on the waders of New Zealand. So this here is just a few of them. There have in fact been 64 different species of shorebird recorded in New Zealand. Um, but only about 25 of those actually occur here regularly. A lot of the others are vagrants that just occasionally blow in here um, in bad weather or when they um, fly off course and end up coming to New Zealand. And they occur here so infrequently that a lot of Kiwi bird watchers might only expect to see them once or twice in a lifetime birding here. So what we've got here is most of the regular ones uh, and what we've tried to show is the diversity amongst New Zealand shorebirds. Particularly noteworthy is the diversity in the shape and size of the beaks amongst members of the shorebird group. Um, so we've got some, like the eastern curlew down there near the corner, um, which has an extremely long pointy bill for probing. Um, and other things like the godwit and the tatler, which are other members of the sandpiper family, which all typically have those long pointy probing bills for reaching into the mud and soil for invertebrates. And then on the other hand we've got some species, mostly members of the plover family, like the black-fronted dotterel or the banded dotterel, which have short stubby beaks, which are not much good for probing but are meant for picking food items up off the surface of the ground, things that it's seen with its uh, keen eyesight and big eyes. In terms of size, the shorebirds range from that eastern curlew again, which is the biggest of all the world's shorebirds and has the longest bill of any of them, down to the redneck stint, uh, which we've put roughly to scale with the curlew down there, uh, which is about the size of a sparrow, weighs in the region of 25 grams. A few particularly notable uh, shorebirds. We've got the Rybill here, which is one of the birds that we were most excited to go and look for when we came to New Zealand. It's an unusual member of the plover family and is famous for being the only bird in the world with a bill that bends to one side. Another bird that we were excited to see up in the top right corner here is the Black Stilt, which is uh, known for being the world's rarest shorebird one point in the 1980s the population of this species fell to about 25 adult birds and it's doing a little bit better now after intensive conservation efforts but it does still remain the rarest of all the world's waders. And another uh, special bird in New Zealand, another rare one over here and one that we haven't managed to see for ourselves yet is the New Zealand dotterel. Um, which made the news headlines recently when somebody called Taylor Swift got into a lot of trouble for driving around their breeding habitats during the filming for a music video. Like many bird watchers, I'm far too out of touch with popular culture to really know who this Taylor Swift person is. I just hope he learns his lesson. <laughs> Now the thing that those three species have in common is that um, all of them are endemic to New Zealand. The Rybill, the Black Stilt and the New Zealand Dotterel. Endemic to New Zealand so they're unique to this country. They're found nowhere else in the world. So all of these New Zealand shorebird species could potentially occur here in Kaikoura, but many of them you'll only see rarely, if at all, even though the species may be more common elsewhere in New Zealand. For example, the Bartel Guadrup and the Red Knot are both species that we've seen only once in the time that we've been here, um, and we describe them as only short-stay visitor species to Kaikoura, so they do occur here every now and then during the summer, 
but they never stick around for long. They move on elsewhere pretty quickly. And that's because there's not really the right habitat here for them. Um, many shorebed species prefer large open areas of intertidal mudflats or the muddy margins of freshwater wetlands, um, which we don't really have much of around Kaikoura. So now we're going to concentrate on the species that do regularly occur here. And first we're going to look at the species that are the long-term locals, the ones that are here all year round. Starting with everybody's favourite, the spur-winged plover. Yeah, the spur-winged plover, or as it's also known, a masked lapwing or cheese face. Although it might just be us that calls it cheese face. I think it is just us. Uh, so the proper name is actually Mast Lapwing. That's its official name and what it's known as um, to the rest of the world. Um, and it also occurs throughout Australia um, and also in New Guinea. Um, although the ones in Northern Australia and New Guinea are a little bit different. So a different subspecies, uh, which you can tell because it has much bigger slices of cheese on its face. And this is such a common familiar species to most people in New Zealand that it's easy to forget that it actually hasn't been in this country very long at all. In fact, until the early 1930s there had only been two records and then in 1932 suddenly five birds turned up near Invercargill, presumably having flown across from um, New South Wales or Queensland and from those five founding birds, the species very quickly multiplied and spread all over the country um, to become extremely common just about everywhere in suitable habitat. And for this species, suitable habitat um, is almost any kind of open space. Yes, yeah, so that includes man-made environments as well as natural habitats. For example, they love farmland paddocks. Uh, they are also happy in urban areas, including golf courses, parks, playing fields. We've seen them in car parks or nesting in the middle of roundabouts or even on top of buildings. So that flexibility and adaptability is part of the reason for the success of the mass lapwing. They're also uh, aggressive and very protective when they're nesting. They've got those horny little projections or spurs on their wings which they can use um, to attack and they're very noisy and will dive bomb any intruders um, that are going into their territory to protect their young which you'll know that's pretty intimidating if it's ever happened to you. Around Kaikoura we've seen them nesting in paddocks on top of the peninsula. Um, this picture at the bottom shows an adult that had two ch tiny little chicks with it um, alongside the sheep. We've also found them nesting on the beach in South Bay which is a little more unusual. You can see the nest um, in the top picture here. Um, quite typical of a shorebird nest with three eggs, uh, beautifully patterned. Um, eggs laid straight on the ground with barely any attempt at nest construction at all. Here there's just a few bits um, of seaweed arranged for camouflage. The mass lapwings are resident here all year round but with some localised movement associated with the breeding season so you'll see um, birds dispersing out to individual territories to breed and then congregating again after the breeding season. Um, over the last few weeks we've been seeing flocks of mass lapwings again. Um, once we saw 30 birds roaming around um, in the paddocks. We've actually recently seen 110 mass lapwings all together at the sewage ponds a couple of weeks ago. This species is generally non-migratory, although obviously they did manage to arrive here in New Zealand in the first place, so they are capable of travelling large distances, but will generally stay in the same area um, as long as the conditions are suitable for them. So our next long-term local shorebird species is another invader from Australia. And this one is the Pied Stilt. 
or as it's known in other places, the black winged stilt. Um, again, in New Zealand, we usually use a slightly different name to everywhere else. Um, this species is actually an extremely widely distributed shorebird, occurring almost all over the world on all of the main continents, although there is some debate as to whether it's one very widespread species or a number of very similar um, species with smaller ranges. Um, but in any case, they are all very similar to each other. And the name comes from its most striking feature, which is its ridiculously long legs. And this species has the longest legs of any bird in the world relative to the size of the bird itself. And as Hazel said before, this is another uh, bird that's come over from Australia in relatively recent times. And uh, it's thought to have colonised New Zealand only about 200 years ago. And just like the lapwing, after arriving here from Australia, it didn't take them long to multiply and spread out, and fairly quickly uh, this species was a common sight just about all over the country. But they occur in various wetland habitats, both inland and on the coast. Um, the local hotspot for this species seems to be the town sewage ponds. And since arriving in New Zealand, the pied stilts have really made quite a nuisance of themselves by interbreeding with the native endemic black stilts. And so that's reduced the number of those precious purebred black stilt offspring that are produced. Um, and this interbreeding has happened to the extent that almost all of the pied stilts that you'll see in New Zealand show some noticeable signs of black stilt ancestry. Um, and that mainly appears as a greater extent of black in the plumage than we would otherwise expect to see for this species. And this was quite noticeable for us, having been quite familiar with the um, pied stilt over in Australia. Um, so it was noticeable to see them here in New Zealand, how much more black some of them have, uh, particularly around the neck. If you look at um, this pair of stilts up in the top left hand corner, the right hand bird of that pair looks pretty much as we would expect to have seen the species um, in Australia. So you might call that looking like a purebred um, pied stilt, but its partner looks a bit more scruffy around the neck. It hasn't got that nice clean edge of the black markings on the neck, that very clean white collar that extends around the back of the neck. Um, so that bird is showing more black than we would expect and some evidence of having uh, black stilt in its history. This other bird on the top right hand corner, one that we'd seen recently um, on Jimmy Armour's beach, much greater extent of black um, forming a complete collar around the top of the breast there. Um, and you can see birds that show even even greater extent of black than that. Um, and this, this species has quite a lot in common with the spurwing plover, um, also being very aggressive and protective when it's breeding. Um, and it's able to make use of some man-made wetlands like the sewage ponds here in Kaikoura. There are small numbers present here all year round and we hadn't actually seen them nesting anywhere until we saw um, a pair of adults with two juveniles at the sewage ponds recently as shown in that bottom right hand picture, which suggests that they did nest there or at least somewhere pretty close nearby. Um, so these pied stilts are generally long-term locals here, um, but in some other regions the populations do show seasonal movements um, with birds that breed inland moving to the coast in winter, and we have recently started to see um, more pied stilts popping up on the coast here, so that probably explains that and other inland breeders move uh, over to the North Island for the winter. So our next species is another long-term local, but this time it's one that hasn't colonised from Australia. Yeah, our next species is the variable oyster catcher, which is another one that should be familiar to most people, 
we are living Kaikoura. Unlike the previous two species, the variable oyster catcher is an endemic species to New Zealand. So this particular kind of oyster catcher occurs nowhere but New Zealand, although there are some quite similar closely related species in other parts of the world. Also unlike the two previous species, the variable oyster catcher is very much a coastal bird. They occur right around the coastlines of New Zealand, um, but hardly ever venture inland at all, always stay around the edge. And they're common right around the coast. The majority of the population is on the eastern coasts of the two main islands. But you certainly get um, smaller numbers uh, right around the other coastlines as well. Like many oyster catchers, in fact like just about all oyster catchers around the world, this is known to be a very long-lived species uh, and banded birds have been known to live in excess of 30 years. Despite this species name, you're quite unlikely to see it catching any oysters, but they do eat a wide variety of shellfish and other invertebrates um, along the shore. And this slide just uh, shows the variety of different foraging methods that they use to find their prey, including um, using their bill to prize limpets um, and other invertebrates off the rocks, um, they love cockles and they're able to tackle bivalves by using their strong bill to insert between the two shells and prise them open to eat the flesh inside. They'll also um, use that long bill to probe deeply into the mud um, to extract nice big long juicy worms. Another thing that you might notice from this slide is that the variable oyster catcher doesn't appear to be very variable. Um, and that's true around Kaikoura and the local area. Most of the birds um, tend to be plain black and we reckon about 10% have um, some white on. So here you can see some examples of the different forms of the variable oyster catcher. These are all the same species. Um, in the top left hand corner you've got the plain black version that we see most of the time. Below that in the bottom left hand corner there's the pied version of the variable oyster catcher. And up in the top right hand corner there's the intermediate version that's uh, it's got a little bit of white on his belly but it's quite um, smudgy and blotchy and he looks a little bit scruffy. Um, the name variable oyster catcher makes a little bit more sense in the North Island where the proportion of the, the pied birds in the population um, is higher in the North Island. So they're a bit more variable up there than they are around here. The variable oyster catcher, um, as we said before, is one of our long-term local species and some of the pairs that nest around here will remain here pretty much all year round. They'll often stay together as a pair year after year and sometimes they won't even leave their own territory at all during the course of the year. We've found several nests around uh, the peninsula. Uh, that one we found up in the top left corner there was just on the grass above the, the top of the beach. Um, but they'll also nest actually down on the rocks and again very typical shorebird nest speckly eggs just laid more or less straight onto the ground. Now one thing you might notice about the variable oyster catchers in Kaikoura is that a few of them have these coloured bands on their legs and those bands have been put on by Lindsay Rowe as part of his study of this species and one thing that he's found from doing this colour banding study is that although a lot of the adult birds do stay here just about all year. He has recorded some much longer movements um, of individual variable oyster catchers, mostly of young birds which once they leave the nest need to disperse somewhere else to find their own territory. 
and he's had birds fly from here um, up towards Golden Bay and some of which have actually returned back to Kaikoura subsequently uh, and also birds that have gone south from here as far as Christchurch so there is actually more moving about than um, was initially suspected but that is mostly uh, the young birds the bird in the picture here with the white flag on its leg is one that we've seen regularly around Kaikoura since uh, we arrived here um, it says AMO on its leg flag uh, so we know him as AMO originally we used to see it um, just on the rocks outside the YHA although recently he's relocated to near Point Keen which is where uh, we've seen this bird recently and that particular one was actually banded up in Nelson so that's one of these birds that actually has moved a fairly significant distance Our next species is another species of oyster catcher the South Island Pied Oyster Catcher and this one is more of a seasonal resident in that it moves away to breed and it's not generally present here all year. So the South Island Pied Oyster Catcher, also known as the Sipo for short, um, it, again like the variable oyster catcher it's a species that's endemic to New Zealand and it doesn't breed anywhere else. Um, you'll occasionally have uh, individuals of this species popping up in Australia um, which is where we actually first saw this species um, but only as a vagrant generally they're only found in New Zealand it's called the South Island Pied Oyster Catcher even though it occurs on the North Island as well often in very large numbers um, because it breeds only on the South Island and um, it's actually New Zealand's most abundant oyster catcher and we were um, impressed to discover the population of these guys is about a hundred thousand which is 20 times more than the variable oyster catcher and part of the reason probably for the much greater abundance of this species is that they're much less coastal um, than the variable oyster catcher so they're quite happy to um, occupy habitats away from the coast. Now a little bit to help you distinguish the difference between the two oyster catcher species. Now this slide shows the South Island Pied Oyster Catcher and also the pied form of the variable oyster catcher. Uh, and these uh, species that are very confusing to um, a lot of bird watchers in New Zealand um, because obviously they are pretty similar. So the South Island Pied Oyster Catcher on the left is a slightly smaller bird and as you can see in the picture it has a proportionally longer and thinner bill. Uh, it's a less dumpy, less thick set looking bird than the variable. It's also much cleaner looking, very smartly uh, well demarcated black and white areas. A clean white belly um, and that little white hook that comes up the side of the breast around the edge of the wing is often a good pointer for a sipo. However, you can see this uh, variable oyster catcher in this picture it does show a bit of that as well, although it's much smudgier and blotchier than it is in the sipo. If in doubt, one of the best ways to tell is to just wait for the bird to take flight. The sipo, as you can see there, has great big white band across each wing and a great big bright white wedge of the middle of its back whereas the variable oyster catchers um, as in the bottom right picture generally just have a little narrow wing bar or nothing at all um, and a fairly smudgy little whitish area um, on the rump rather than that big white wedge As we said before, the sipo breeds inland and generally disappears from the coast in spring to go off to breed, either in riverbeds as uh, we saw this bird here, or on farmland as we saw this bird. You'll have to excuse the rather unattractive background of this photo, um, which we've included to show the sipo family we spotted in a sheep paddock um, 
back in early October where the parents were very busy finding worms to bring to their chicks. And oyster catchers are actually the only family of shorebirds that will bring food to their chicks rather than the chicks finding their own food. During the summer we noticed more of these South Island Pied Oyster Catchers appearing in Kaikoura as they were returning from breeding. However, in December we were very dis very surprised to find a pair nesting on the beach up near the sewage ponds. So that ruins what we've just told you about them all breeding inland away from the coast. Um, here you can see we took a very quick picture of their so-called nest, um, surrounded here by all the footprints of the adult. Um, and then about a week later we returned for another really quick peep and found that this tiny little chick had hatched out. Then by about January we saw the adults accompanied by two big chicks so they seem to be um, seem to have been very successful nesting there. Although we did see that pair nesting on the beach around here that is a bit unusual uh, on the whole, the South Island Pied Oyster Catcher is the first of the species we've seen so far which we would consider to be a true migrant. And just to summarise the migration that most of these oyster catchers undertake, the area we've highlighted on the map here in red um, very roughly equates to the, the usual breeding range of the Saipo. So pretty much all on the South Island, inland, and generally to the east of the Southern Alps. After breeding, the Saipos do undertake a migration out towards the coasts, and they head to the coast and just scatter themselves all the way around the coastlines of the main islands. So in Kaikoura, uh, once we get towards the winter, we do see an influx of this species when they start to spread out to the coasts and arrive back here. However, the biggest numbers of the Saipos actually migrate a further distance and head up to harbours and estuaries up around the northern end of the North Island, where in some places great big flocks of them will gather during the winter. And some of the birds that head up there are probably migrating in the region of a thousand kilometres each way every year. Now the next species we're going to look at also undertakes an interesting migration. Yes, this is the banded dutchel. Now we're not going to talk in too much detail about this species because next week um, you're going to hear another talk all about uh, this species and what it gets up to around Kaikoura. Um, but we do just want to say a little bit about them because they do have a very interesting life strategy that contrasts with a lot of the other species that are here. So the banded dotrel is an endemic New Zealand breeder. So it's here and nowhere else. Now some of these birds migrate and some of them don't depending on where they, where they live and they breed. Of the birds that migrate they um, do a really unique east-west migration across to Australia and once they get over there the, they change their name and the Aussies call them the double banded plover which is the name that we knew this species as first so we might call it that name by mistake. So we'll just quickly look at the migration of the, the banded dotterel um, and as we said, some of them undertake this unique migration right across to Australia and back. But where the birds migrate to depends on whereabouts in New Zealand they breed. Almost all of the birds that migrate across to Australia are the ones that breed in the uplands of the South Island, um, in the Canterbury High Country and inland Otago. The banded dotterels that breed in other places in New Zealand um, largely undertake shorter range migrations. So as the arrows on here indicate, uh, some birds on the west coast that breed down there uh, just undertake a fairly short migration up to Farewell Spit or that sort of area. Um, a lot of birds from the Nelson area, sort of northeast uh, South Island, and probably some of the um, uh, birds from around here migrate up to North Island, particularly to the northern coast of the North Island. 
And then again, you've got some populations of breeding banded dotterels, which barely do any migration at all. Some of them are more or less what we might even call long-term locals. So some of the birds that breed on the coast, which probably includes a lot of Kaikoura's birds, um, may actually stay here just about all year round. So our last species is another seasonal resident. It's uh, another migratory species, probably the most incredible migration of any species that we've covered tonight. Um, and this is the ruddy turnstone. So this is a bird that's uh, strictly only on the coast, mainly on um, rocky shore because that's its favourite sort of habitat. Um, it's got a worldwide distribution so you can find it um, pretty much anywhere in the world where the right sort of habitat exists. It's a summer visitor here to New Zealand, probably present between about October and April. And it's um, a bird of the sandpiper family. It doesn't really look like a, a typical sandpiper because it's got fairly short legs. Um, it's quite a stocky little bird. It's got a fairly short um, beak which uh, it's very strong uses for literally turning over over stones and poking in seaweed in search of um, hoppers and other invertebrates. So here in Kaikoura, um, one of the best places to look for this species is on Jimmy Armour's Beach up in the top left hand corner there. You have to kind of look quite hard because they're so well camouflaged um, in amongst all the seaweed. Um, you can see quite a lot of them there if you have a look at high tide. They um, seem to like going there to roost in amongst the seaweed. And they also feed there as well. Um, they really love um, where areas where the seaweed is nice and rotten because that's full of invertebrates for them to eat. Um, and they've got really a voracious appetite. You'll see them feeding a lot, particularly at this time of year where they're needing to eat as much as they possibly can in order to gain a lot of weight. And these birds will put on a huge amount of weight before they leave town. Um, they'll just about double their weight and that's because they've got to fuel a really incredible migration which is what Rick is going to tell you about. Very little is actually known for certain about the ruddy turnstones that we see in New Zealand. We don't even know for absolute certain where they go to breed. However, uh, there have been some recent studies on this species in southeastern Australia, in Victoria, um, and it's very likely that the New Zealand birds follow a very similar migration to those ones. So we're going to look at the Australian study now, and just bear in mind that the New Zealand birds uh, assumed to do a similar thing. So once the birds here have uh, put on all that weight, they've fattened themselves up enough, put on all that energy, ready to migrate, they set off on their journey. And the birds in South East Australia would begin with a 7,600 kilometre non-stop six-day flight all the way up to Taiwan or the adjacent Asian coastlines and that's six days of flying without eating, drinking or sleeping just solid flying for that entire journey and unlike some of the big birds like the albatrosses and the uh, eagles and storks and things which can cover large distances with little effort just by gliding and soaring on the thermals, shorebirds, including the turnstone, just aren't built for that sort of flight. And they need to flap continuously to propel themselves along. So it's quite an incredible distance uh, for these birds to be covering. Once they arrive um, at Taiwan, or their nearby stopover sites, they'll then spend a few weeks again feeding like crazy, just trying to pile back on some of that weight and energy um, because the next leg of their journey is going to take them another uh, non-stop flight, 5,000 kilometers or so, right up into the Siberian Arctic, which is where the uh, Australian birds were nesting and pretty much where we strongly suspect the New Zealand birds go to as well. Once they arrive in Siberia, 
they have the fairly brief Arctic summer to complete the whole business of uh, displaying, finding a mate, mating, nesting, incubating their eggs, uh, and hatching their chicks mm. before it's time to start thinking about heading home again before the return of the Arctic winter. And one of the interesting things that the Australian study discovered was that no two of the turnstones that they tracked took the same route home again. Some of them more or less followed um, the same northward route in reverse. They came back down the Asian coastline uh, and then cut back across Australia, back down into uh, the southeast for the, the non-breeding season again. However, some of the birds undertook a much more extreme uh, and perhaps more unexpected route, flying straight out across the Pacific Ocean um, to make landfall on the Marshall Islands or some of the other uh, small island groups in the middle of the Pacific. And then from there they'd continue back towards Southeast Australia, maybe stopping off once or twice on different islands um, before returning to more or less exactly the same spot that they'd been uh, banded in. And for those birds that did undertake that trans-Pacific homeward route, those birds would have been travelling in the region of 27,000 kilometres each year just on their migration. And some of these birds, which can potentially live into their 20s, would be covering more than half a million kilometres in their lifetime. Assuming the New Zealand birds do undertake a very similar migration to the same places, uh, the ones in this country will be covering even greater distances. So next time you see those funny fat little birds scuttling around in the seaweed on Armour's Beach, you can just think that they've had quite a journey just to get here. Just to finish off, um, we've made a map of where to watch waders in Kaikoura, so it's colour coded for the different species that we've been talking about tonight, just to give you an idea of where you might go and have a look for them. So a great place to try is Jimmy Armour's Beach, particularly at high tide when a lot of um, shorebirds use that beach as a roost over the high tide, um, as long as there's not too many dogs running around or people on there, um, you can see a hundred shorebirds or more um, on that beach, particularly ruddy turnstones and the double banded plovers. Also there's usually a good collection of oyster catchers roosting at the far end of the beach there too. And just next to there you've got Point Keen, which is always worth a look. Um, for shorebirds, best time is probably at low tide or as the tide's going out because um, the shorebirds move on to there to forage over the rock platform over the low tide period. The other hot spot of diversity is up at the sewage ponds, um, mainly because there's a number of different habitats there. So there's a little freshwater creek that runs out to the ocean. Uh, the beach itself and also the sewage ponds of course so you can pick up a few different species there and also have a look at all the ducks and maybe find something else interesting up there. Uh, the beach over at South Bay is also a good place to get a look at the double banded plovers while they're nesting if you're very careful because um, the nests can be very hard to spot. Um, and also just at the moment they're starting to congregate in larger flocks and we're seeing a lot of birds feeding um, on the race course itself so we reckon if there was going to be a rare plover species um, we may well see it on there so that's worth a look too. So do get out and enjoy having a hunt for waders around Kaikoura. If you'd like to find out more about shorebirds, uh, these are some of the places where we um, found some information, some of the sources that we use. Uh, there's a great book in the uh, Kaikoura Library, The Shorebirds of New Zealand by Keith Woodley, uh, which has a lot of information about all of the shorebird species that occur in New Zealand. Uh, and the book on the left, The Birds of New Zealand, uh, that's the field guide that we've been carrying with us around the country. New Zealand Birds Online is a, a brilliant 
online encyclopedia of all of New Zealand's birds. There's lots of information, lots of good photographs on there. Uh, it's well worth a look. Uh, and it's also worth checking out eBird, where we post all of our sightings uh, from around here and everywhere else. And thousands of other bird watchers around the world also log what they've seen. So you can log into there and uh, have a look at what's been seen recently in this area. Uh, for more information about the uh, the studies on the ruddy turnstones and the banded dotterels, I've got a couple of scientific papers here uh, which we were interested to read. And we'd also just like to thank Lindsay Rowe um, for telling us a bit about his uh, banding project with the local variable oyster catchers. Uh, before we finish, just a quick plug about some other birding things that um, that we do. So every week on Saturday we have Saturday Sea Watch and this is a free event. Um, anybody is welcome to come and join us at 6.30 at Point Keen. We go up to the top um, at, at the lookout with our telescope and our binoculars and we just have a look for anything that we can see from there. So um, seabirds including albatrosses and shearwaters, the shorebirds are running around on the rock platform below. Um, we often see dolphins, um, always lots of seals, and we always hope that there'll be a whale there too. So come and join us for that if you're interested. We also um, have a website uh, called South Island Sticky Beak, where we've just been writing about some of our um, adventures we've had in Kaikoura and also further afield around the South Island. Some of the things that we've found interesting that we've seen while we've been here. You can also um, follow us on Twitter if you're interested in such things um, where we just post pictures of birds and other things that we've found interesting recently. So do, do follow us on there if you're um, on Twitter. And the only thing left for us to say now is to wish you a very happy way to watching. We hope you'll enjoy getting out around Kaikoura, um, spotting some waders, and maybe you'll see some of those short stay visitors as well as all the long term locals and seasonal residents. So thanks a lot for listening. If you do have any questions or comments, please do feel free to um, get in touch and let us know. Thanks a lot.